Gracias. As you have just heard, uh, this is a very opportune time to be in Spain and indeed in Europe because there is a very good, uh, if small, exhibition which is opening in the Museo de Bellas Artes tomorrow in Bilbao. And on Thursday, there's an exhibition opening in the Palazzo Barberini in Rome, also devoted to Archimboldo. Uh, in Bilbao, you can see uh, this picture, which is normally here in Madrid, but uh, you can look at it from very close and see how well uh, painted it is. And I'll uh, mention that uh, later. I hope I can be heard. This, let me see. Okay. Now, this, these two exhibitions belong to a whole series of shows that have been held uh, recently on Archimboldo and with publications related to them, which relate to or reflect the renown the artist gained in his own time. The shows have presented and still present this intriguing artist to a broad public, and they've summarized much information, some of it new. Yet several important points of interpretation remain at issue. And uh, in this paper, this lecture, I hope to offer a brief introduction to the way that Archimboldo has been treated since his lifetime. You've heard about mannerism and surrealism, and offer a summary of some central aspects of his work. And in so doing, I'll attend to some of these newer questions. Uh, and I hope uh, to mention three parts to this lecture. The first and longest part will be trying to treat the best known works of Archimboldo, namely pictures like the one you see on the screen, uh, in relationship to the social and cultural context in which they were first made and for which they continue to be produced, why these works became popular and why they were generated, and finally, why most of the seemingly humorous uh, images were more than just a simple uh, jokes, chistes, but held meaning for his intended audience. Now, Archimboldo was probably not very famous when in 1562, at the age of 35, he left his birthplace of Milan in Lombardy. However, when he finally returned there 25 years later in 1587, he became the most celebrated artist in his native city. Uh, and that's at a time significantly in which Caravaggio was young and he no doubt paid attention to Archimboldo. Until his death in Milan in 1593, uh, many historians, theorists, humanists, and poets wrote about Archimboldo and about his paintings. But it was not primarily because of what he did in uh, Italy, what he executed at least for commissions from Italians, that he became famous. His reputation stems from his work for three Holy Roman emperors that he served in Vienna and Prague, as well as working for them uh, at a distance when he returned to Milan. He was named uh, imperial portraitist, contefetta, and Mahler painter uh, by Maximilian II. He, however, who was, of course, the husband of uh, Maria, the daughter of Charles V, Charles I of uh, Spain. He, however, performed a wide variety of tasks uh, for uh, the emperors Ferdinand I, Maximilian II, and Maria and Maximilian's uh, son, Rudolf II. And among other works uh, he did, he supplied pictures to several European uh, rulers. And I now believe, after having seen this picture up close, that this one that you see on the screen was not one that belonged to the initial series done for the Viennese Habsburgs, but was made for here uh, for, uh, for Philip II of Spain and uh, was hanging in the Alcázar at least until perhaps the fire of 1734. Anyway, it's, it's, signed and, uh, it's signed and it's beautifully painted. It's the kind of thing that you'd want to, uh, to impress a ruler with, it's particularly a connoisseur like uh, Felipe II. Now, Rudolf II, who was Philip II's nephew, cousin, and brother-in-law extended him an extraordinary sign of favor by confirming and improving Archimboldo's coat of arms. More significant still, Rudolf made Archimboldo a count, and this was an honor that was bestowed during the 16th century on only two other artists, namely Titian, Tiziano, and uh, uh, Sodoma, Sodoma. Now, 
Leonardo da Vinci provided an important precedent, precedent for Archimboldo's multifarious activities in a letter he wrote in 1481-1482 to Ludovico Sforza, offering his services to the Duke of Milan. He listed his skills as painter only after mentioning 10 other abilities, placing painting even after architecture and sculpture. And in so doing, Leonardo, I think, gave an inkling of what might have been expected from a court artist, not just in Milan, but in Renaissance Europe in general. And uh, therefore, at the imperial court, Archimboldo designed tournaments and masquerades. He acted as an expert on the acquisition of antiquities. And he also was involved in acquiring animals and wondrous birds from the New World. He designed codes that could not be cracked. He found ways of crossing rivers and of diverting water, and he invented a, a, a color harpsichord, a cembalo, which played by colors. He also made drawings depicting silk manufacture, which were uh, intended for a grotesque decoration uh, for the president of the imperial court chamber. Now, because of this polymorphous character, this many-sided character, and its relation to Leonardo's own broad competence and court connections, uh, I've called uh, Archimboldo the Habsburg's Leonardo. But as this lecture shall emphasize, the focus for Archimboldo's paintings should not be placed on Milan, but on the Habsburgs. The wide range of tasks, which I've just mentioned, which Archimboldo carried out, provides a background for considering the many-sided works on which I will concentrate this evening. These are, of course, as you see here, Archimboldo's paintings of composite heads. The pictures were largely responsible for establishing his reputation, and they are still his best known and most popular work. One testimony to this, uh, this painting, which belongs to a series of the Four Seasons in the Louvre, apparently, according to the information from the curators and the public relations there, are the most popular paintings in the Louvre after the Mona Lisa. Their postcards are the most sold. In Archimboldo's composite pictures, as you see here, a head and part of a torso, uh, the, by the way, the frame around this is added later, so you should concentrate on the interior, are formed out of objects, utensils, animals, fruits, or vegetables pertaining to the subject, or in a few instances, possibly a person represented or to whom allusion is made flowers for spring, and as you see here, fish and crustaceans and other creatures uh, for water, which belongs to one of the traditional four elements which went along with the four seasons. In this picture, you can see, and there have been identified, over 60 identifiable species of aquatic creatures of fish and mollusks and the like. Uh, the title of this talk uh, relates to the idea that Archimboldo's composites were described as transformations of nature. The many flowers that are to be seen in uh, this picture, and you can see it in color in Bilbao, belongs to a private collection here in Madrid. Uh, this is the original version of Flora, uh, the fruits in Vertumnus, and the careful depictions of animals that constituted a version of Earth uh, were noted. And now uh, in the Belbao catalog, they've identified all of the flowers that can be seen here. It was said that these components had been observed from nature, and this is a point worth emphasizing and to which I'll return. But of course, no such heads exist in nature. Indeed, contemporary descriptions of Archimboldo's pictures recognized uh, that there was great artifice that had gone into their uh, creation. And here we're looking at the earth, which is composed of animals. They noted the fundamental visual paradox in the composite heads. While the pictures seem to constitute heads, when looked at as holes, if you focus on the individual details or examine them from close up, they dissolve, as this one does, into individual heads or bodies of animals, or birds or flowers in other instances. What you could call a visual paradox exists 
because both ways of apprehending the picture cannot be maintained simultaneously. Either you perceive the heads as wholes or the individual fruits or other constituent features are uh, understood or apprehended, but you cannot perceive them both at the same time. Some paintings by Archimboldo, like uh, this one, compound the paradox. They seem to be composite heads, but when turned upside down, a still life of fruits, vegetables, or meat appears. And of course, they cannot be seen in both ways at the same time. And uh, I was mentioning Caravaggio, and you might want to think about his still life in comparison to this earlier one by Archimboldo. Contemporary commentators on Archimboldo also furnished an apt description for Archimboldo's pictures. Writers such as Fonteo, Calmanini, and others readily related what they saw to ancient stories that would have been familiar to many educated people, including Archimboldo himself, when he wrote poems on his paintings. They associated his pictures with metamorphoses, uh, as recounted in the poetry of Ovid. So I've chosen to allude to the name of, uh, of Ovid's, Ovidius, Ovidio's poem uh, in talking about metamorphoses of nature. It provides a central motif for the discussion of some key aspects of Archimboldo's career. Now, despite the fame that Archimboldo enjoyed in his lifetime, and the numerous copies and imitations, uh, and you can see two of them in uh, Bilbao, his paintings spawned throughout the 17th century. By the 18th century, his reputation had gone into decline. His paintings were mentioned, if at all, as extravagant jokes or caprices. And this idea has persisted in the notion that they are merely capricious or whimsical. And perhaps this is why during the 19th century, only one scholarly article appeared on Archimboldo, and this was about uh, something that we don't know very much, if anything, about, namely portraits, in which I think none uh, uh, exist in painting. It was not until the early 20th century that Archimboldo's composites regained much attention, and indeed they were given attention by painters here in Spain. Uh, prominent avant-garde uh, modernist artists of the time such as Pablo Picasso and Salvador Dali, uh, uh, knew his images and may have been inspired by them. André Breton singled Archimboldo out as a pre-modern forerunner of surrealism, as we've heard. A key moment in Archimboldo's reception occurred in 1936 when photographs of his works were included in a landmark exhibition at the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York. Subsequent reception followed in a similar vein. The first monographs devoted to Archimboldo all talked about him uh, in this way. That is to say, the scholarly uh, uh, studies of him accumulated his works and said what he'd done, but they all related him uh, to 20th century art, including an introduction by the modernist artist Oscar, uh, Oscar Kokoschka. This early bloom of scholarship seems, however, to have done little immediately to change Archimboldo's standing. And it may even be that Archimboldo's associations with modernism help explain why he was not always appreciated in Europe before the later 1950s. In a more uh, conservative time, this picture was indeed even sold uh, from the museum in Graz, although it belonged to the imperial collections, and it's now in the Liechtenstein collection. But Archimboldo's critical fortunes, as you've heard, improved as he was picked up by this new wave of interest in mannerism. Interest in mannerism began to surge in the late 1950s when it was seen as a movement in 16th century art and culture that embodied a turn to the irrational, anti-natural, or anti-classical uh, in art and in culture in general. M a reaction to the high renaissance uh, of the early 16th century. Many critics of the 1950s and 60s did, however, not treat mannerism exclusively as something of the 16th century. They also related it to movements in 20th century art and culture. The German jur uh, journalist Gustav René Hocke published one of the most influential versions of this interpretation in a book called The World is Labyrinth, Manner, and Mania in the 
in European art. He considered mannerism to be a perennial feeling or attitude which was expressed in most cultural epochs as a reaction to the clear forms of classicism. While he mentioned other aspects of Archimboldo's activities, as did other writers, his uh, most telling remarks were really on these composite heads. And he found them uh, to be, quite literally, a forerunner of Picasso. Uh, the pictures, such as this, exemplify mannerism, but in the sense that they were not merely un- or anaturalistic, but antagonistic to nature. In this regard, uh, Hakka views Archimboldo as the master of what he calls total metamorphosis, but not of nature. Archimboldo is instead to be related to many exemplars of 20th century art that similarly abstract from or militate against the representation of nature in their works. Now, this influential approach may be taken as framing a view of Archimboldo that it persisted for a long time. The first major exhibition uh, to be devoted to Archimboldo was called the Archimboldo Effect. Although much had been learned during the intervening de decades, when the exhibition appeared in Venice in the Palazzo Grassi in 1987, the works by Archimboldo were not treated just as historical phenomena, but emphasized the effect associated with his inventions. As an exhibition, the show just divided Archimboldo in effect into two parts. Gaia Letty had the individual pictures by Archimboldo down below, and up above were all the surrealist images which he supposedly had influenced. Now, a similar split, I'd argue, between historical and ahistorical approaches is evident in recent exhibitions. Uh, there are efforts now to deny the importance of historical context and the effort to find meaning, and directly to challenge and reject such approaches. Uh, Post-structural readings are uh, proposed that compare the idea of Archimboldo seen here to a kind of uh, deconstructive mise en abime, which is a perpetual recourse of self-reflection. I would say that the idea of the labyrinth that is devoted or directed or enunciated by Hoca uh, is an idea now developed into something, something from which there is no exit. One thinks of the title here of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's play, we close. The organizer of several exhibitions also endorsed this notion of a mise en abime as defining the paradoxes of Archimboldo. They downplay Archimboldo's joking caricatures uh, and they regard uh, the notion that they could have serious images nonetheless as something that doesn't pertain. Uh, and indeed, as the show in Rome will show and the ones in Milan previously, had shown, uh, there's even an effort to deny the pertinence of the imperial court to these pictures. So let's turn to a brief review of Archimboldo's career, emphasizing these so-called metamorphoses of nature. Archimboldo was the son of this man, Biagio Archimboldo, whom we see here in a drawing by Bernardino Luini, by whom you have a nice painting next to the Leonardo workshop, uh, one in the uh, Prado. He no doubt trained with his father, who would have introduced him to the office of the works of Milan Cathedral, for which he executed several commissions from around 1550. The younger uh, Archimboldo collaborated in designs for these windows, still in what's now the south transept of Milan Cathedral. And he also painted in other churches in Milan. In uh, in, he also designed uh, this work, uh, a, a unique tapestry. Well, it's one of two tapestry designs he made. This is in Como Cathedral. In Milan, Archimboldo might have become familiar with several sorts of works that may have inspired his composite pictures. These include uh, metals and Deroto ware plates with phallic imagery uh, made into heads. And it's also possible that he knew this print by Tobias Stimmer, 
which is a satirical image of the Pope as a gorgon's head. Archimboldo could also become familiar with the heritage of Leonardo and his nature studies in particular uh, through various intermediaries who had his drawings and papers, including Lomazzo, uh, Leonardo's heir, Francesco Melzi, who may have painted the picture here in the Prado, uh, his associate, Bernardino Luini, who was a friend of Archimboldo's family, and the painter and sometime associate of Archimboldo, Ambrogio Figino. Now, Leonardo's Lombard legacy lay in his paintings, writings, and drawings. Among the latter were images such as you see here, some of which, as I say, he, Archimboldo may have known. He did make, Leonardo did, many careful studies of plants and flowers, and uh, in his notes and in part in the drawings, he also suggested how you might make a monster by composing a creature out of several sorts of animals. These and other sorts of Milanese images of carnivals may have helped inspire him. However, uh, the career that Archimboldo enjoyed before 1562, when he went to the imperial court, provides little concrete evidence to indicate that he did any composite pictures there or that he was much interested in nature studies. Although he may have become aware of some of the various components and ideas that later entered into his pictures, and I don't doubt this, much of the essentially naturalistic element in them is not to be found in the early work in Lombardy. I think it's necessary to push very hard to discover some isolated signs uh, of what might have been behind pictures of the four elements or seasons. For instance, here you could look at the uh, garlands of fruits uh, on the tapestry designs from Milan and Monza or the uh, frames of some of the still life paintings. But um, I think we have to be cautious here because uh, as you may know, and uh, this is a point that should be emphasized when you look at the tapestries that, for instance, are in the Descalces Reales, uh, designed by Rubens, uh, the t borders of tapestries would have been left to the discretion of the tapestry designer in most, uh, the tapestry maker in most cases, not to drawn by the designer. In any case, framing garlands of fruits were executed by other artists uh, who were in Central Europe such as Domenico Pozzo, who was active at the imperial court just when Archimboldo came, and may have been one of the reasons, because he's from Milan, that Archimboldo was invited. One other detail that might be uh, pointed to uh, is the, um, are the, the uh, lemons uh, that you can see, and I hope you can see these, uh, in, uh, uh, hanging from the tree of Jesse, in Monza Cathedral, which is in part painted by Archimboldo. Uh, they are, uh, they're not lemons, but they are what you call an Italian cedro. Uh, and this relates to the prominent fruit that you can see in the picture of winter. So there may be some interest here. Uh, although the joint uh, work of Archimboldo and Maida here is debated. Yet, as far as the actual making of nature studies is concerned, only one drawing, and that's this one, uh, can be dated or reasonably attributed to Archimboldo. As you can see, this represents a lizard or salamander uh, and uh, a chameleon. Uh, there is a date of 1553, uh, in digits resembling some seen in other drawings attributable to the artist. However, it should be noted then on the same folio, and it's a big folio, so I can't show the whole image here, uh, there appears a mongoose with the date of 1572, so this is again not probative. In any case, in the end, it's hard to explain why or how in Lombardy, Archimboldo could have made all the nature studies that went into the composite heads. Why would he have spent all this time doing that if he didn't have a commission for the works? Uh, and who the patron would have been for such pictures before he was associated with the imperial court. And most important, why he should have spent so much time and intense labor uh, involved in depicting details of nature uh, in composite pictures if he did not have regular employment or had not been commissioned uh, to paint such pictures. Now, this stands in stark contrast to what we can see 
happening in uh, the pictures done uh, for the imperial court. A mass of information associates the invention and execution of these composite heads with the imperial court of the Habsburgs in Vienna and later in Prague. Most obvious and most significant, as you can see on the shoulder, and I hope you can make that out uh, again here, there's a date of 1563, the year after he arrived at the Habsburg court. The date appears in the straw on the shoulder of summer, where the artist's name is also painted, is also painted as if it appears woven into the collar, Giuseppe Archimboldo. And uh, this picture is also, though it's hard to see because of the dark background, also signed. Um, and uh, it also bears, this is winter, bears some personal references to the Emperor Maximilian II, uh, and uh, who is his intended recipient, uh, and whom we know from contemporary documents uh, the pictures were intended for. Sources refer to Archimboldo as, in fact, not an imperial painter, but a royal painter, being uh, at first, meaning that he was painting for the king of Bohemia, as he was then, uh, and the king of the Romans, which is like the Prince of Wales, the uh, successor, intended successor to the Holy Roman Emperor, and that was Maximilian II. One telltale sign uh, relating winter uh, to Maximilian uh, and there are a number of them, is the device here of the uh, fire iron. This is Hierro de Fuego, uh, which is used to strike fire. And this is an element of the chain of the Golden Fleece, which is, of course, the Burgundian uh, house order, and the King of Spain is still the head of this order. Uh, the uh, Habsburgs... Um, had this, well, he's a Bourbon, but the Habsburgs had this as their, uh, as their chivalric order. Another element is the M, which is for Maximilian. And then there is a little crown on top of it. Uh, all details. Uh, the telling detail of the M is uh, very important because this, in fact, is woven into the cloak in the same place where the actual cloak that the emperor wore uh, as his most favorite item of clothing, and I can say this because we have the nice evidence of actual real objects, uh, because when Maximilian, was, his body was dug up in 1974, he was wearing a cloak with the M in this place. So Archimboldo must have seen him uh, when, uh, uh, when he painted this picture. Archimboldo's decision to paint the pictures of composite heads for the imperial court on what you could call speculation seems to have been a clever choice. Like the elements which he seems to have been planning to go along with the seasons, and which a source says he gave to Maximilian together some years later, he may well have intended them to attract attention and gain favor. In any case, they had this desired effect uh, because he, uh, Maximilian reacted extremely favorably to Archimboldo's pictures. He took them into his bedchamber when they were given to him on New Year's Day in 1569. And when the Saxon elector August visited Vienna in 1572, he reacted somewhat similarly. Uh, and he um, also uh, seems to have asked for or been impressed by him because Archimboldo the next year uh, design uh, pictures with the Saxon arms, as you see here on the cloak. Um, these pictures were taken, as we know, probably into, Archimbo into uh, the Saxon duke's uh, private chambers because they don't appear in the inventories of his collections. In any case, a year later, 1564, after he did the first pictures of the seasons, this one and the others, he was made, Archimboldo was made, imperial painter. Now, there are many reasons why the series of seasons and elements uh, would have been uh, liked by Maximilian and the imperial court in general, and for that matter, uh, other princely recipients. In the first series of seasons, as I've remarked, the M uh, and the fire iron and the crown mark 
uh, this picture as Maximilian's own. He was personally associated with winter. He personified the season of winter in court tournaments. He wore a costume of winter uh, in, uh, a, a few years later. And this is, as a collaborator of Archimboldo said, uh, because uh, this was in keeping with the Roman idea, not necessarily the uh, medieval or Christian idea, which still pertains in many parts of Europe, that the year begins in January in winter, and that's an imperial idea, not, for instance, in March, or on, for instance, in Florence, the year begins on uh, San Giovanni Battista, and it, be, it be, uh, begins in other cities in Italy on other uh, festival days. So um, this is an association which is, again, imperial. <clears throat> the alteration of the marks, as I suggest here, uh, also relate to their use for other courts. <clears throat> and even though uh, this is a, a copy, uh, it's a copy of one of the pictures that was probably here in Madrid. And as you see, it has the uh, Spanish uh, royal arms on the shoulder. This is an image uh, of uh, a chamberlain. The allusions are therefore extended to all of these pictures, making them, as it were, servants of the emperor and making them under the emperor's uh, rule. In the series of paintings uh, made for the Habsburgs in particular, references such as uh, the fire iron or the sheepskin cloak, uh, that is to say the sheepskin here, suggest, of course, the golden fleece, the uh, lion suggests the Herculean uh, ancestors of the Habsburgs, uh, and uh, these ideas uh, are related to their claims to uh, rule. Uh, and uh, indeed, the peacock, which is prominent here in um, air, these are reconstruction of the four uh, elements, also is a Habsburg uh, symbol. The horns or antlers that appear here also suggest the um, crowns that these make, make them all kinds of royal or imperial images. All these signs reinforce the interpretation that however else the paintings may be interpreted, the pictures of the seasons and elements were allegories that pertained uh, to the rulers to whom they were given. And uh, the other poems which you'll see discussed in the Bilbao exhibition on uh, the floras or on uh, the pictures on Bertumnus were presented with the artist's approval and they suggest this whether or not they were written after the event. As the collaborator of Archimboldo suggests, when we look at these pictures, um, <coughs> the seasons uh, allude to the eternity of the Habsburg's reign, that the seasons come and go eternally uh, and so will the Habsburgs reign forever. And when we look at the four elements here, uh, as the, uh, the idea is, as the emperor rules over the body politic of uh, states, so he rules over the elements that constitute the world and the seasons, the parts of the year. Hence, the allegories also assume their particular bodily form. The appearance of these images as heads also goes back to ancient Rome. They're explained by the origins of the myth of Rome's imperial destiny to which Fonteo refers. According to this myth, a head, which was decapitated, which was dug up uh, on the foundations of the Capitoline, the Capitolio, the Campidoglio in Rome, uh, foretold that Rome would be head of the world, Caput Mundi, and the capital of an empire. And the prophecy is therefore transferred to the Holy Roman Emperor. In addition, as you can see, two of the elements face left, two to the right, uh, as do the seasons. Two in each series are female, and two are male, according to their gender uh, in Latin. Uh, for instance, aqua uh, is uh, aqua is feminine, and uh, aire masculine, for instance. Uh, hence, they relate to each other harmoniously, as it is said befits the harmonious reign of the Habsburgs. 
all of these elements, all of these details, coalesce in this picture of Rudolf II, uh, which is, in a way, uh, the culmination of all of these pictures painted uh, a couple of decades after the original ones, in which uh, Vertumnus is shown as god of the seasons and implicitly of the elements, who can, by metamorphosis, assume any shape he wishes. That's what Vertumnus does. The power of the emperor is thus shown to extend over all of nature, as it does implicitly in the pictures of the seasons and elements taken as whole series. The appearance, as you see here, of fruits and flowers in one single image indicates, moreover, that eternal spring has arrived, because only in the golden age, only in when eternal spring comes, can all fruits and flowers bloom together. This signals the arrival of a new golden age, a time of harmony and peace has arrived with the reign of a new Augustus. And Roman poets of the time of Augustus, such as Propertius, furthermore associated indeed the sculpture of Vertumnus with the mission of internal, um, eternal imperial rule they associated with Rome. All of these overtones are associated now with Rudolf II. The message of Vertumnus is consistent with some of the implications of the appearance of citrus fruits in the painting uh, here, uh, where we talked about the citrus fruits uh, made for, Max, uh, for Maximilian II, Rudolf II's father. The two citrus fruits, which are a cedro or uh, a lemon and an orange, also referred to, uh, probably not in Spanish, but it's called a Spanish orange, may refer to the belief that these are fruits associated with a golden age in which all fruits and flowers bloom uh, simultaneously, even in winter. They are aptly chosen because they are some of the few fruits, indeed, uh, for whom or for which flowers and fruits bloom at the same time. So the flowers bloom at the same time as fruits, suggesting that there's more than one season here. There are many more reasons why presenting these in the form of metamorphoses of nature and why the idea of the heads, the idea of the head of the body politic, would have been attractive to the Habsburg court. And that leads us to a consideration of their naturalistic uh, content, the metamorphoses of nature. To begin, Ferdinand I was keenly interested in the scientific investigation and study of nature. Long before he became uh, emperor, when he succeeded Charles V, he displayed his interest in gardens and gardening. He brought Italian and Netherlandish gardeners into his employ, and from the 1530s, he had gardens laid out in Vienna and Prague, most famously at the Prague Belvedere. From the 1540s, he had orange and lemon trees brought to Vienna, and an orangery, a place to keep oranges going in wintertime, was made for them. From 1542, he had exotic birds and animals at the court in Vienna. In view of this continuing interest in the cultivation of citrus fruits, the presence of lemons and oranges in Archimboldo's winter can be related, I think, to the naturalistic interest as well as to political symbolism. Maximilian II, for whom this picture was made, shared his father's interest. By 1552, 12 years before he was emperor, he had already established his first menagerie and wild animals uh, came to be present at most of his residences. A lion, a lynxes, a bear, and an exotic uh, bird are indicated uh, as being at Kaiser Ebersdorf outside Vienna and also were probably at this uh, now badly damaged but still surviving in part uh, residence uh, outside of Vienna. You, um, it's the uh, Neugebäude, which would have been a great villa um, outside of Vienna. Uh, he uh, also had many gardens laid out on the Prater and uh, many more in the environs of Vienna, such as this uh, one at the Neugebäude, where he had collections of birds and animals. And a fountain designed by Archimboldo has been associated with this building. Archduke Ferdinand of the Tyrol, to whom we owe uh, this uh, star villa, on the White Mountain, where the decisive battle of the Thirty Years' War in 1620 took place. The battle was uh, down here. 
And uh, there's a church built for uh, commemorating the victory of the Catholic side. Uh, this uh, ru ruler also uh, had uh, gardens, as you can see in part, although this is a somewhat wintry view here, uh, completed. When Archimboda visited Prague, he, he would have seen these gardens uh, too, and he would have seen the ones in the Belvedere. Finally, Rudolf II obviously had an interest in such uh, ideas, in such things as a study of nature. He described, he's described as the greatest lover of plants and flowers in the world. He kept gardens, an aviary, a fish pond, a lion's den, moats for stags, and other wild animals near or at his castle in Prague and elsewhere in the area of the city. Now these interests coalesced in the imperial collections, starting with Ferdinand I, who is said to have had the first collection called a Kunstkammer in Europe, uh, and through Rolf II, who had the most famous Kunstkammer in European history, many Habsburg emperors had major collections. And these also had wonders of nature as well as works of art, and gardens and menageries and books like this one would have complemented them. <laughs> books such as this, uh, which is interestingly enough with all the languages written on it, were made by scholars at the imperial court. This is one by Anselm Boethius de Boat. Uh, and starting with the reign of Ferdinand I, uh, and you can see these books, some of them in the Bilbao exhibition, they included many important scholars. It's also clear that Archimboldo by being sent to purchase Ware Wonders of Nature, was being trusted as an expert in natural history. Now, uh, and uh, this is uh, something that we need to think about when we're looking at the flowers and fruits that we look at in uh, pictures done for him. Now, the recently uh, rediscovered diary of a Saxon physician who was one of the personal uh, doctors of Emperor Ferdinand I indicates that natural history and wonders or freaks of nature formed major topics of conversation at the emperor's dinner table. And here, of course, I'm showing uh, a famous image of a, a courtly dinner. This supports the impression uh, from the Tres of the Duke of Berry. Uh, this supports the impression that the emperor had a personal interest in such matters. Significantly, the first written mention of Archimboldo's seasons appears in the context of these table talks. Uh, he says, the Saxon physician says, that über der Mittagtafel, the participants of the meal were taken to see pictures whose description corresponds exactly to the paintings of the Four Seasons by Archimboldo. Archim they, they are said to be uh, wonderful to look at because of their rare invention. And Archimboldo's pictures were thus immediately drawn into a discussion of natural history. Now, Uber der Mittagtafel may be translated as during the mid midday meal, indicating that this was the time of discussion, but it may also allude to the place where such discussion occurred, where the paintings may have been hung. Now, without going into the intricacy of interpreting what these things might have mean, I think it's important uh, to think about how uh, the natural coincides with the political or representational in this case, too. Meals, as we see here, at the court were not simply an occasion for nourishment. They were part of an etiquette in which the court also showed its majesty by the abundance and rarity of the repast of the meals offered, by the luxurious tableware uh, that was used, and you see that on the table and being brought from this other table, uh, and uh, by the trappings of authority which hung behind them. And this is behind the midday table, namely a tapestry, as you see here, suggesting how these things may have been hung. Similar sorts of meals took place at the Habsburg court. And here we see, again, a banner, a table with fancy objects. Uh, there's uh, Ferdinand of the Tyrol, uh, Rudolf II, and various archdukes and other nobles at the table. Uh, these banquets became known as Schauessen, literally show banquets, because they were representative shows of imperial grandeur. Hence, whether or not Archimboldo's pictures were hung in the room itself in the, Habsburg, in the Habsburgs uh, Hofburg in Vienna, 
in which this sort of repast occurred, and we know that this occurred in a place where tapestries were often hung, they would have carried this connotation. Taking people to see them would also have been a political gesture. If the individual components in the paintings of seasons and elements are scrutinized more carefully, they too may be seen as in inextricably related to what he did in Vienna and uh, in Prague and what could not have been seen in Italy. The naturalistic details in these paintings are related, as you see in this work, to several scores of uh, drawings of animals, birds, flowers, and plants by Archimboldo. These are drawings of creatures, or watercolors of creatures, gouaches of creatures, that could have been seen rarely in 16th century Europe, but were made available by, indeed, through coming through Spain and Portugal by the worldwide empire of uh, Spain, uh, which controlled or had contacts with many other parts of the world. We know that many rare creatures were shipped uh, via uh, Lisbon, Lisboa, and Sevilla to Central Europe. Animals seen in Archimboldo's drawings include a, uh, a, a, a diker and a wildebeest uh, from Africa, a black buck an antelope, which we see at the bottom of this image, uh, and a coati, the, uh, the uh, dikers at the top, uh, were all sent, uh, for instance, to the uh, famed Bolognese naturalist Ulisse uh, Aldrovandi, so they were also used as natural history studies. He also, Archimboldo did, made studies such as this one of a reindeer and a moose. Uh, these are animals from the extreme parts of northern Europe which could not have been seen in southern Europe, clearly. They could not have been seen in Italy, and there's a rather weak drawing by Jacopo Lagozzi of a moose that makes this point clear. The earliest date on animal and bird drawings by Archimboldo uh, is from, indeed, 1562, and this is the date that Archibaldo arrived in Europe, in Central Europe, and dates from the 1560s and 70s appear on several subsequent sheets that were made in Central Europe. Uh, the deer uh, probably is related to uh, uh, the Imperial Deer Park in Prague or uh, at Vienna. If you go to Prague, it's still called the uh, Deer Moat, the Yeleni Pchikop, uh, the area right below the castle. It's demonstrable that Archimboldo used these sheets for his paintings, as many of the details of his animal drawings, and here we see the moose studied with the horn separate and the flowers, that's important to note the flowers here too. The horned or antlered creatures, including the moose and the leopard seen in his drawings, appear in the paintings, uh, for instance, here of Earth, you can pick them out. Although it's difficult to pair things up exactly, uh, there's been a very intelligent effort to do this in uh, the show in uh, Bilbao. These kinds of flowers you also see, and these uh, leaves, uh, the, 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 the uh, twigs here too, uh, appear in the paintings of uh, flora and of spring. In fact, uh, we know uh, how uh, these things may have been used. Several references point to the way that Archimboldo used his sources. Comenini specifically says that Ma Maximilian II provided Archimboldo with the chance uh, to see uh, his menagerie and to study uh, the real life creatures in it. And these sources were to be used in a painting that were to be sent, was to be sent to the King of Spain and that we know from sources is a version of this. And here are all the various drawings by Archimboldo and their use within this painting. The description used mentions creatures, as you see, that can be seen here, and there's no reason to doubt this, or has been demonstrated in the Babal uh, exhibition that uh, the other, uh, that the paintings of Flora and uh, of Spring, which belong to Madrid collections, also used flowers and twigs. In Vienna, there are now more than 60 studies of animals and birds by Archimboldo and contemporary copies of two more. The bindings of the books in which they were kept date from the period of Rudolf II, and many flower studies and paintings of flora attest to the presence of uh, this interest in Rudolf II's Prague as well. Uh, I mean by that is that the flora, the paintings that you can see in Bilbao that belong to the Fondacion Marc here in Madrid, uh, those uh, paintings were done for Rudolf and not for Maximilian. In addition to their political dimension, 
the evident naturalistic appeal of Archimboldo's drawings and paintings composed from nature was thus broadly shared. The use of nature studies is obvious when we consider these things which were used by uh, the natural historian Aldo Vandi, and in fact he has woodcuts after them in his uh, published books on animals. And so those are scientific books as would have been seen at the time. And uh, they were also sought after elsewhere. Aldrovandi procured 21 studies of animals from Archimboldo and sought in vain to have him supply a depiction of a rare Hungarian flower. And very intelligently, the Bilbao show uh, has that, the, what the way the flower would have looked. Five of the animal studies still survive in Bologna. These are two of them. And at least 22 drawings of animals also uh, I found in uh, Dresden where they came from the old Duku collections, and they must have been sent to the elector of Dresden of Saxony from Prague or uh, from uh, Vienna. Ten paintings by the artist, including groups of the seasons and elements, were in Dresden, and from the point of view of naturalism, they correspond to a continuing interest in nature studies that is most strongly expressed in the decoration of Schloss Radebeil in the uh, 17th century. If you go to Dresden, you can take the streetcar out, and you can see a 17th century residence which has all kinds of rare Brazilian birds on the ceiling, so it's quite interesting. It's now uh, known that Elector August was also keenly interested in gardens and had them laid out at various residences. He also kept stags and other animals in reserves north of the city. And finally, of course, we have to recall <coughs> that there were paintings both in the Liechtenstein collection and 10 paintings here in the Royal Palace, the Alcázar in Madrid, uh, and as far as, uh, by Archimboldo, at least 10. And as far as Spain is concerned, we know that the gardens and cultivation of citrus fruits were of great interest to the king, to Felipe II, as the uh, gardens uh, at Aranjuez and uh, elsewhere uh, attest. Making such drawings and paintings probably accounts for a good deal of what Archimboldo did during his time at the imperial court. Even though we cannot account for all of their precise recipients, and these are flowers and a bird, a rare bird, uh, several versions of composite paintings of elements and seasons were made by him and his workshop during his stay at court. And after he returned to Milan, he made several more composites, including uh, Vertumnus. And here's one of the versions, as I say, made for the Saxon court. We can identify this. Uh, this is a version maybe for another a member of the Habsburg family, possibly for here, uh, that Archimboldo also, uh, look at, possibly for Madrid. Uh, some other of Archimboldo's court activities were mentioned uh, at the beginning of this lecture. And uh, I wanted to talk about how the festivals also revealed Archimboldo's broad knowledge and also his political messages. The designs that do survive indicate that some of the participants were dressed up in costumes that looked like these things, as peculiar as that may seem. And recently, more mention of designs by festivals have been found which indicate that he worked on such things Archimboldo did through the 1580s. He was kept busy uh, with such seemingly minor task, another new document has uh, been discovered, as desi designing stalls and tables used for the vendors, for the salesmen of objects seen going on in the Prague Castle. So given all these kinds of tasks, he probably had little time to do much else, and he was very successful in doing these things. If we consider all of the jobs that Archimboldo had to do, uh, this may explain why, uh, in addition to, uh, he had little time for much else. Now, uh, this takes us and, uh, to a brief consideration of something I think needs to be emphasized here. Uh, if you go to, uh, to Rome, you'll see these pictures, the one on the right, uh, which is thought to be an uh, earlier picture by Archimboldo, dated before he came to uh, Vienna. And I hope you'll see that I've given enough in information to suggest that cannot be the case. And if you look at them and compare them, we could have a lesson in connoisseurship uh, later, you can see that they lack the kind of quality and the firmness and the, uh, the, the painting seems to fall apart. It seems to be, even though uh, dated, uh, it can be proved to existed in 1597 uh, in an inventory from Munich, 
uh, it does not mean more than it was a picture of the time. Uh, the, uh, the most important point is to be made that the other versions uh, belong this lack, the signature, and the date, which is, of course, a key thing in all of the versions by Archimboldo himself. So uh, the conclusion to be reached is to say that the easiest way to resolve this question is to paraphrase what was said about six, such pictures, that they were all crudely composed figures, imitations of Archimboldo's paintings, uh, inventions. They are mere thefts, semplici ruberie di sue cose. Likewise, prints seeming to replicate Archimboldo are also copies of his inventions. And uh, it's said already in 1592, in Archimboldo's lifetime, that all the workshops of, of Italy were making such things. Finally, I'd like to uh, add in the next, uh, end in about uh, 10 minutes, it's okay, we began a little late, uh, we turn to another element that went into Archimboldo's images, their humor. Archimboldo's colleague wrote a treatise on laughter while he was working, and here's another example, you can just compare the quality of these works, while he was working at the court. Giving and telling a joke was a requisite required by a, a, of a ruler since antiquity. And if you read the, court, uh, the Cortigiano by Castiglione, also of a courtier. In the poem on Vertumnus, the god recognized, the poem, the god speaks for himself here, that there would be a laugh or a smile on the lips of the viewer. He also says that another painting that may survive in Gripson represented a, a, a doctor uh, of laws was received with laughter. And it's said that of the pleasure this gave the emperor and the laughter provoked at court, there is no need for me to tell you. The reversible, reversible heads also are said to have caused laughter. Humor was thus doubtless an important component of Archimboldo's composite paintings. And there may have been a range of kinds of humor expressed, but let's look at what the court really found elsewhere uh, to be described as what we in American English would call laugh out loud funny. In Archimboldo's design for a tournament held in 1570, some peasants appeared as a comic interlude. Uh, the peasants fell off their horses and quarreled with the tournament organizer. They failed to strike the target. They danced and began fighting. One of them dressed as a bride with stuffing for breast. He was broad as a beer barrel and he had an ugly dish face, a dish-like mask and he ogled uh, the women present. He was described as gar lecherless. For court uh, circles, and we see this from the wonderful pictures by Velasquez here in the Prado, laughing at unfortunate people and lower classes was funny. We're reminded here that for Aristotle and the poetics, the laughable is a species of the base or ugly, and the comic was appropriate for lower classes. Making caricatures that poke fun at people also may, in this context, have had a further intent. Zazius, whose image we may see here, was in fact two-faced, as he had tried to undermine uh, the emperor's uh, acquisition of a library. He tried to block this acquisition by lying that it was full of heretical books, but uh, there's uh, reason to mock him uh, because uh, the, this was found out and uh, the silliness and the lies were revealed. Similarly, in this picture of Wolfgang Latzius, a well-known picture, this is a copy probably, uh, he's composed as a, out of books, not just because he'd written a lot of them, but because he tried to block the appointment of the learned antiquarian scholar and merchant Jacobo Strada by saying he was merely a painter. Strada was a friend and, and a collaborator of Archimboldo. So Archimboldo may well have thought it appropriate to uh, again, mock this double-tongued scholar. In fact, uh, the ugly and the seemingly comical in Archimboldo's work does not exclude that they may have some further meaning uh, behind them. The image of Rutumnus here says this directly when it reveals itself to be a portrait of Rudolf II as the god of seasons and elements. In so doing, uh, the poet, speaking as Rutumnus, evokes 
the image of the Silenus. This is, uh, as we understand, a statue or a box of the ugly god Silenus that is hideous on the outside but hides something beautiful underneath. In the uh, dialogue by Plato, which we translate in English as the Symposium, Alcibiades compares Socrates to Silenus, someone who is ugly on the outside but beautiful within. The comparison was a well-known commonplace in the Renaissance. And it's been suggested that this paradox of the Silenus of Alcibiades stood for the notion of the serious joke, the idea of serious play. It provided a pedigree uh, for the paradox and made the paradox an important genre in the Renaissance to convey meaning, not to lead to nothing. I've thus long argued that Archimbaldo's paintings were serious jokes. Now this notion of a serious joke was widely disseminated in Europe. It's known, of course, from the Netherlandish humanist uh, Erasmus, who was, by the way, very important here in Spain until the Erasmianism was crushed in the mid-16th century. In his adages, Erasmus included the Silenus of Alcibiades, which he took quite seriously, even comparing Christ to Silenus. In the praise of folly, Erasmus also made folly herself into a Silenus. But by this, Erasmus had folly explicitly say that the Silenus reverses expectations when you open them. When you open the box, you see something beautiful. This reminds us of the way that Archimboldo reverses expectations in his paradoxes. And this you see also in the great uh, French writer of the Renaissance, Francois Rabelais, who also explicitly presents the Silene of Alcibiades as his model for his own books in the prologue to Gargantua, a meaning it is something comical on the outside but serious on the inside. Most important, Archimboldo and the imperial court were closely connected with Erasmianism. So this may account for some of the problems with Spain too. Archimboldo's close associate, Fonteo, was the nephew of the leading disciple of Erasmus in Italy. He would have been well-versed in Erasmian thinking. He wrote a text for Archimboldo that explained the serious jokes. Jacobo Strada, too, uh, possessed banned books by Erasmus and imbibed his spirit. Ferdinand I was closely tied to Erasmus, who dedicated a book to him and influenced his education. Uh, Erasmus uh, uh, also advised Ferdinand to be moderate in religious dealings. Maximilian II took a similar Erasmian moderate course in religion. One further remark, and we've heard about Ernst Gombrich earlier, when Gombrich is invoked as following a different line of thought uh, to this interpretation of Archimboldo's images as a serious joke, I think that the comments are taken out of context and misunderstood in the present Rome catalog. Arch uh, Gombrich did lament that art historians have become intolerably earnest, and he certainly joked a lot. He hardly, however, meant to deny the idea of serious play, serio ludere, which is encapsulated in the idea of the serious joke as seen in the paradox of Archimboldo's paintings. He did believe that this was an important constituent of cultural expression. His remarks, however, appear in an essay on the great Netherlandish uh, Dutch uh, historian Johan Heisinger, which he republished adding a subtitle, The Seriousness of Play, another way of saying serio ludere. When the essay first appeared in a volume with tributes to Heisinger, who had written a book on homo ludens, a uh, man at play, Gombrich, in fact, dedicated his paper specifically to the memory of Rosalie Colley, the very author of the important book Paradoxa Epidemica, where the notion of the serious joke is uh, elucidated in relation to paradoxes. I recommend uh, this book, by the way. These are notions that forcefully apply to Archimboldo in his still life paintings. Gombrich knowingly both began and ended his essay talking about Erasmus, whom we've also seen as important for considerations of Archimboldo. Far from denying the relation of the verbal to the visual, as the organizer of uh, recent exhibitions who invoke Gombrich incorrectly would have us do, 
He also included his essay on Heisinger in his book of tributes, one on Freud that gets to what is really the psychological heart of this paradox, uh, where he called it verbal wit as a paradigm of art. Verbal wit as a paradigm of art. Having mentioned Hooke and other mid-20th century books, I want to end by citing another great book that appeared in the 1940s. This is a book by Lucien Febvre, Le Problème de l'Incroyance au XVIe siècle, The Problem of Disbelief in the 16th Century. Uh, and he offered a methodological reply to ahistorical, even anti-historical currents, like those that today deny meaning to 16th century paradox. At a moment when things were bleak for France during the Nazi occupation and Vichy regime, and several European thinkers on the left were renouncing the Enlightenment and reason, Febre, who was also a person of the left, who, but was a great historian and geographer of culture and founder of the Annales School, uh, announces a tier adherence to Enlightenment historiography. He stated outright that anachronism was the greatest sin of the historian. Dedicating his book to his friend Ferdinand Braudel, the famed historian whom you know for the book on Philip II and the Mediterranean, Febre posited that understanding, not just knowledge, was the chief goal of the historian. Now, Febre's book is about Rabelais, not Archambault, but we've seen that the interpretation of Rabelais' comic work may be related to that of Archambault. Both were serious jokes. Febre established a context in which the jokes and the ironic and seemingly disbelieving comments, even obscene comments, by the great French Renaissance author could be assessed. For Febre, no matter how obscene or extreme Rabelais' jokes were, it was impossible for the religion of Rabelais, which is the subtitle of his book, to have been atheism, as some scholars had then argued. Febre's main argument is directed against anachronism in favor of creating a sense of what was possible in a time of the past based on judicious evaluation of the sources. It is no accident that Febvre's masterpiece has been the target of uh, attacks by those who would instead mix periods indiscriminately and deny the essential enlightenment argument for historicism that not everything is possible in all times and places and certain ideas are not. And there's a book you can see uh, about the anachronistic renaissance in the bookstore here. M uh, mutatis mutandis, it may be said that Archimboldo's composite heads present paradoxes, but they are not simply to be reduced to what the French call a mise en abîme. Archimboldo's uh, metamorphoses of nature are not dada, but full of meaning. And I hope that this review of Archimboldo's composites give you some sense of their significance, of the richness, besides all the visual pleasure that they can give you in looking at them, and also some of the things that you might think about when you uh, perhaps have a chance to see them either in Bilbao or when the picture comes back to Madrid. Thank you very much for your attention.